SpaceX asks the U.S. Senate for faster regulations, India reveals big exploration plans, and Falcon Heavy launches the most metal of all missions. I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF. It's Friday the 20th of October, and there's much more to come this week in spaceflight. This week, Blue Origin announced that it's developing Blue Ring, a versatile orbital platform aimed at providing in-space logistics and delivery. Okay, now I know that sounds very PR speak, so here's a simpler explanation. It's an orbital tug, but with a ton more stuff than you'd expect. For example, in its press release this week, Blue Origin claims this platform could, in theory, be used as a data relay system, it could be used for refueling, it could be used as a cargo transportation vehicle, you name it. With Blue Ring, the company hopes to tap into the growing in-space services market. Companies like Rocket Lab are already building and launching similar platforms like Photon that pretty much promise to do the same thing as Blue Ring, and in the long run, this is actually expected to be an even larger market than the launch market. If you think about it, with cost of access to space going down, companies now have to start thinking of a way to lower the cost of being in space. Cheaper, more capable platforms in space is one way to do this, especially if you can host payloads directly onto them or repair and refuel older satellites that are already in orbit. Orbital tugs are also becoming more popular, as it's cheaper for a company to buy a ride on a large rocket with a tug on board rather than buying a dedicated flight on a small sat rocket. Blue Ring is designed to fit on all rockets with a minimum 5 meter diameter fairing, so launch vehicles like Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy, or Vulcan could be able to fly this vehicle, and of course Blue Origin's own new Glenn rocket could do so as well. The company aims to debut it in the 2025-2026 timeframe, so perhaps we'll see it on one of New Glenn's first flights. India has big plans for its future of spaceflight exploration. This week, the Prime Minister of India directed the country to have a space station in low Earth orbit by 2035 and to land Indian astronauts on the moon by 2040. See, I told you they were big goals. This directive came as the country prepares for the upcoming in-flight abort test of the Gaganyang crew capsule and reviews the schedule ahead before the first crewed mission of the new spacecraft. The Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, is planning to conduct well over 100 tests of this new spacecraft, with around 20 of them being of major importance. Following the in-flight abort test, three uncrewed missions are set to take place in 2024 and 2025, with a crewed mission set to occur in the later half of 2025. This directive also comes right on the heels of the successful Chandrayaan-3 mission that landed on the lunar surface, and the Aditya L1 Solar Observatory that is now on its way to the Earth's Sun Lagrange Point 1. In order to develop these new capabilities, funding will have to be increased, and the country will have to develop brand new technology that it doesn't yet have at this point. For instance, the largest launch vehicle that India has at the moment can only put a couple of tons of payload in a translunar injection orbit. But in order to land people on the moon, the country will need to build a much larger rocket with the capability of sending about a couple dozen tons to translunar injection. An alternative to this could be for India to take a ride on rockets from other countries or take part of NASA's Artemis program. But that would also mean that those aforementioned capabilities wouldn't be developed in India. So we'll have to wait and see what route India decides to take. There's certainly lots of time to work on all of this technology. Along with the goals of building a space station and putting its own people on the moon, the country has been directed to build more ambitious interplanetary missions, such as a mission to Venus's orbit or a Mars lander, all within the next decade or two. So it definitely looks like we'll have a lot to look forward to from the world's most populous country. Now let's take a look at this week in launches. A Falcon 9 lifted off on October 13th at 2301 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. It was carrying a batch of 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites to low Earth orbit as part of the Starlink Group 622 mission. This came five days later than initially expected due to upper level winds that delayed an earlier attempt on October 8th and SpaceX giving priority to the launch of NASA's Psyche spacecraft, which we'll talk about in a bit. The first stage for this mission, B-1067, was flying for a 14th time and it successfully landed on SpaceX's drone ship, A Shortfall of Gravitas. 
This week in China, we had the launch of a Chongzheng 2D rocket on October 15th at 54 minutes past midnight UTC from the South Launch Site 2 at the Zhiquan Satellite Launch Center. Breaking the recent streak of Yaogan launches, instead, this one was carrying the fourth Yunhai-1 satellite into a sun-synchronous orbit. The Yunhai-1 series of satellites are weather monitoring satellites built by the Shanghai Academy of Spaceflight Technology and used for disaster prevention and mitigation, as well as observation of the atmospheric, marine, and space environment. Another Falcon 9 launch took place on October 18th at 39 minutes past midnight UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. As usual these days, it was carrying another 22 Starlink V2 mini satellites into low Earth orbit. The first stage for this mission, B-1062, was flying for a 16th time, joining B-1058 and B-1060 as the third booster to have more than 15 flights under its belt. As expected, the booster successfully returned to Earth, softly touching down on the deck of SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. With the two Starlink launches this week, SpaceX has now launched a total of 5,286 satellites, of which 362 have re-entered and 4,306 have moved into their operational orbit. And of course, this week we also saw SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket launching NASA's Psyche spacecraft. Liftoff took place on October 13th at 1419 UTC from Launch Complex 39A in Florida. This was Falcon Heavy's fourth launch of the year and eighth launch overall, and it was also its first NASA science mission. The Falcon Heavy side boosters B-1064 and B-1065 were flight proven and were flying for a fourth time. They successfully landed back on land at Landing Zone 1 and Landing Zone 2. These will next be refurbished and then used again on the USS F-52 mission, which is currently targeted for late November, and then they'll be stripped of their recovery hardware and reused again next year on the Europa Clipper mission, where all three Falcon Heavy boosters will be expended to send the spacecraft to an escape trajectory. This Falcon Heavy launch with Psyche also featured an expendable booster due to the amount of oomph needed to send the 2.7-ton Psyche spacecraft to the asteroid belt. Psyche was successfully deployed about an hour after launch, and it is now well into deep space and being monitored as expected. The mission will study 16 Psyche, which is the largest M-type asteroid that we know of. These M-type asteroids are characterized by having a relatively high density compared to other asteroids, which means that it's likely that there's a high concentration of metals in their composition. Now, this isn't the first M-type asteroid that a spacecraft has visited. That honor goes to ESA's Rosetta mission that flew by 21 Lutetia in 2010. But this will be the largest of them, and it's thought to be of even higher density than that one. This type of asteroid is, frankly, the kind that we know the least about. And in the case of 16 Psyche, it's theorized that it started off as a planet that got hit by a really massive object and was stripped of its crust and mantle, leaving behind just the core of the planet. So we could definitely be looking at some new information with this mission that we haven't seen before. The Psyche spacecraft will take six years to reach the asteroid, flying first by Mars in May of 2026 and arriving at 16 Psyche in August of 2029. This week, we also had what some would call more space drama regarding SpaceX and the FAA. Let's start with what prompted this drama. This Wednesday, there was a hearing in the Senate Subcommittee on Space and Science, which was titled Promoting Safety, Innovation, and Competitiveness in U.S. Commercial Human Space Activities. The witnesses for this hearing were Karen Shinnewark, who was formerly at Relativity and SpaceX as Policy and Government Affairs Officer, Wayne Monteith, former Associate Administrator of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation at the FAA, and also former Commander of the 45th Space Wing that controls all of the launches from the Cape, Sarisha Bandla, Virgin Galactic's Vice President of Government Affairs and Research, William Gerstenmeier, SpaceX's Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability, and Phil Joyce, Senior Vice President of the New Shepard Business Unit at Blue Origin. So as you can see, those are a lot of people that are or have been very involved with the human spaceflight industry from either side of it. This hearing was focused around the current statutory moratorium that prevents the FAA from regulating the safety of human occupants during spaceflight activities. So far, the FAA's job is just to make sure that those outside of the rocket are safe, but not the ones inside of it. This moratorium was supposed to end on October 1st of this year, but it was extended to January 1st of 2024. The reason for this moratorium was to allow the commercial companies involved with human spaceflight to learn what kind of safety regulations may need to be in place, as it's a completely new situation. 
Everyone at the hearing, both senators and witnesses, agree that this moratorium needs to be extended for a few more years before actually putting regulations into place. SpaceX, of course, also had a lot more to say. Ahead of the hearing, Ars Technica and the Washington Post released similar articles talking about what SpaceX would be demanding on the hearing, which is, unsurprisingly, faster regulations. Indeed, Gersten Meyer cited multiple times that the low number of staff members at the FAA had slowed the approval of the launch license for the next launch of Starship. He also mentioned that this low staff count is also starting to affect Falcon 9 operations. Overall, the feeling of the hearing was not, the FAA is bad, but more along the lines of, please give the FAA more resources to do their work. Now, SpaceX has been launching a lot. It's already at 75 launches this year and on track for 100, with plans to launch up to 144 times next year. So yeah, you could say that SpaceX itself has created a lot of the work that the FAA now has to sort through due to this increase in cadence. But SpaceX isn't the only company affected by this. Many other companies have had their licenses delayed while their rockets were ready and waiting due to the long timelines and the lack of staff. And it's only getting worse as more rockets are developed and launched. In fact, all of the other witnesses were also asking for faster regulations, more staff at the FAA, and a more lean approval process while maintaining the safety of people. But of course, SpaceX has been the most vocal of all of them. It's yet to be seen if all of this will have any impact, but it is worth mentioning that no current official from the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation was invited to this hearing, and thus far, Congress hasn't actually put down the money needed to increase staffing at that office. So just like with everything, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. In our last episode, we reported on the launch of a Vega rocket, and at first glance, it appeared to go nominally. However, it appears that that may not have been the case. The two main payloads were inserted into their correct orbit and deployed nominally, but two out of the 10 CubeSats that were flying as rideshares were not deployed and actually burned up during the deorbit of the Vega upper stage. These two satellites were the Est Cube 2 from Estonia and the Answer Leader from Spain. Ariane Space and Avio, the two contractors for Vega, are now undergoing an official investigation to figure out the reason why these two payloads were not separated. While Ariane Space and Avio are the main contractors of the rocket, the payload deployer for this Vega mission was provided by SAB Aerospace, which also integrated the CubeSats as well. In European spaceflight news, ESA and Ariane Space have updated the upcoming test campaign of the Ariane 6 rocket. Due to the need for more time to solve a problem with the hydraulic gimbal system of the Ariane 6 core stage, the test of this system during a long-duration firing of the rocket will be deferred to next month, while another test will be brought forward. It now looks like the next test will be another launch rehearsal with a short ignition test of the Ariane 6 core stage set to occur in the next couple of weeks. Then, in November, ESA and Ariane Space will perform another launch rehearsal, but this time with a long-duration firing and gimbal test. Once these two tests are completed, ESA will announce an estimate for the first launch attempt of the Ariane 6. This week, Qatar Airways announced that it will collaborate with Starlink to bring high-speed, low-latency internet to some of the aircraft in its fleet. Under this collaboration, Starlink will provide up to 350 megabits per second of in-flight internet connectivity. This now brings the number of airlines adopting Starlink up to five, although this deal in particular is probably the largest of all given the fleet size of Qatar Airways. SpaceX has completed the main structure of its crew access tower at Space Launch Complex 40. If you remember, the company started construction of the structure in order to support Crew Dragon missions from this other launch pad in addition to Launch Complex 39A just a few miles north. This would give the company a backup location to launch Crew Dragon in the event that 39A were to be taken out in an unplanned event. <coughs> Starship explosion. <coughs> It's pretty remarkable that the company has been able to keep up the launch cadence from this launch pad while also building the crew access tower. Next up, we should see the arrival and installation of the crew access arm and pad emergency egress system. This tower will be used as early as next year, first on cargo missions and then on crew missions. This week, Virgin Galactic announced the crew of its next Spaceship 2 mission, Galactic 05. 
This mission will be focused on research, with human-tended investigations riding along on board. Aboard Spaceship Two will be Dr. Alan Stern, Principal Investigator of NASA's New Horizons mission, and while he won't be there on behalf of NASA, he will be wearing a biomedical harness to gather physiological data related to human spaceflight while also practicing for a later flight which will serve to conduct NASA experiments. Dr. Stern will actually be with DOS this Sunday on our NSF Live show, so you probably won't want to miss that when it happens. Along with Dr. Stern will also be Kelly Girardi, who will be monitoring three payloads that will be on board VSS Unity during the flight. And now, fasten your seatbelts, because there's a lot of stuff coming up next week in spaceflight. Starting off this Saturday, we'll have the in-flight abort test of India's Gaganyaan spacecraft on board a modified GSLV Mark II booster. The flight is set to take place from the Satish Devan Space Center on October 21st within a two-hour window that opens at 1.30 UTC. On Saturday, we'll also have what could be the first of up to four Starlink launches in the next seven days. This first mission, Starlink Group 75, will take place out of Vandenberg and is set to lift off within a four hour and 20 minute window that opens on October 21st at 6.19 UTC. The second Starlink mission of the week, Starlink Group 624, will take place from Florida and is set to lift off within a four hour and 31 minute window that opens on October 22nd at 2.16 UTC. A Changzheng 2D rocket is set to launch next week from the Xichang Satellite Launch Center in China with a yet unknown payload. The launch is set to take place on October 23rd at 2001 UTC. A Russian spacewalk is set to take place on the ISS next week to install a new radar antenna, deploy a technology demonstration satellite, and photograph the external radiator of Naoka after a leak that happened a couple of weeks ago. The approximately six and a half hour spacewalk is set to start at 1810 UTC on October 25th. The third Starlink launch of the week, Starlink Group 625, is set to take place just four days after the previous one and from the same Florida launch pad. As of recording, there's no launch window yet, but it could happen in the late evening local time on October 25th, which would be on October 26th in UTC time. This week we'll also have the launch of China's next crew mission to its space station with the Shenzhou-17 mission. Liftoff is set to take place on October 26th, and while a launch time hasn't formally been announced yet, it should take place a few minutes after 3 o'clock UTC given the alignment of the launch pad with the station's orbit. And finally, the fourth and final Starlink launches of the week, Starlink Group 76, is set to take place from Vandenberg no earlier than October 25th. If launched on that day, it would be a record six-day turnaround time for SpaceX's West Coast launch pad. Liftoff would take place within a two-hour and ten-minute window that opens at 6.59 UTC. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news. We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.